We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. And the first two weeks of this series on the life of Paul, we kind of talked about his life from his conversion to his preparation. Thank you. <clears throat> and now, beginning today, we're going to kind of shift our focus and get into his actual ministry and look at his life <clears throat> through some of the different aspects of his ministry today. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll see what Paul, I think, was most passionate about in his life. Uh, there's things that we're passionate about. When we're passionate about something, it's easy to talk about it, isn't it? Uh, there's things that we can talk about at length. Uh, we don't have to use notes. Uh, I could talk to you probably this morning uh, on the Arkansas Razorbacks at length. Without any kind of notes, I can detail a lot of the history, a lot of the highs. We can talk about the lows. We can talk about politics this morning. I, I, uh, I love history. I love reading, all of those things. I can talk at length about a lot of things. When you're passionate about something, you can talk at length about it. Uh, it could be sports. It could be the, uh, a hobby. It could be some sort of entertainment. Uh, uh, Paul and Dee, they went down last week with Matt and Lauren to Kim's news studio, and they talked about the weather with the meteorologist that was there. That's something they could talk at length about. Uh, there's things in your life you can talk at length, and you don't have to try to figure out what you want to say about it because you're passionate about it. You know about it. You can talk at length about it. Well, Paul, he was passionate about the gospel, and it ought to be in our lives that we should be able to talk about things of the Word of God. We ought to be able to talk about the gospel because we're passionate about it. It ought to be natural for us to talk about things of the Word of God. It ought to be natural for us to talk about the gospel and see it lived out in our lives. And so today, from the moment that Paul became a Christian, uh, we shift today to this point that he begins to become passionate about declaring the gospel of Christ. And his entire Christian life was centered around declaring the gospel of Christ. Of Christ, and we'll talk today about Paul the preacher. Paul the preacher uh, declaring the gospel. I think was uh, from the moment that he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. It says right after that, straightway he went to the synagogue and he began to preach Jesus. And from that day forward, what was Paul passionate about in life? He was passionate about preaching the gospel, declaring the gospel. Now, not every single Christian is called to be a pastor. Uh, not every Christian is called to stand behind a pulpit and preach. But in a sense of the word, what is preaching? It's declaring the gospel. It's a messenger, right? The preacher is a messenger uh, declaring the gospel of Christ. So in that sense, as believers, we are all to be preaching the gospel, aren't we? With our, with our words, with our lives, we're to be declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think this morning we can learn from Paul, the preacher, and we'll kind of jump around different points in Paul's life and see what we can pull from this about Paul, the preacher, and how it would apply to our lives and see the different kind of audiences that he spoke to. Uh, there were times that he spoke to large gatherings of people. There were times where it was a one-on-one -on -one audience. Uh, there was times where Paul was speaking uh, to royalty. He would stand in front of kings and declare the gospel. And there were times that Paul was sitting in prison cells uh, talking to other prisoners declaring the gospel. It didn't really matter what audience Paul had, whether it was big or whether it was small, whether they were famous or infamous, Paul was going to take this opportunity to talk about what he was most passionate about and what was it. It was Jesus Christ. And so before we actually get to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 there where we'll look at this text passage, I want to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4. And these are, uh, these are pretty well-known words to us as Paul is writing to Timothy and encouraging him to be uh, faithful to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says to Timothy, because Paul has lived this out, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Now, Timothy is this young pastor. He is one of Paul's 
mentees. He has invested into this young man's life. Paul knows he's nearing the end of his life. And he says, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant. That's to be ready. In season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. You see, in Paul's life, he lived this out every single day. He was ready to preach, to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of the people that Paul gave the gospel to, some of them were very interested in what Paul had to say. But there were other people, they really opposed what Paul was saying. They didn't want to hear this gospel message. But what was Paul's job? He was to declare it to whomever his audience was. And so as he's getting ready to pass off the scene, he's investing into this young preacher, Timothy, and he's saying, preach the word. Be instant. Be ready to preach. Uh, In a book that I've read a couple of different times, it's a book called Called to Preach by Steve Lawson. He says this uh, about what Paul wrote in these verses. uh, To be instant means to be ready to complete a task. It conveys the idea of fixing one's mind on something and being attentive to it. The word communicates a sense of readiness and urgency in preaching, uh, just as a soldier must always be ready to go into battle at a moment's notice. So must Timothy stand guard as a watchman and guard his ministry. Uh, He must always be ready to preach the word. And then he says this. He says there's no other season than being uh, instant in season and out of season. And here's why he says it. He says, Timothy has to be ready to preach when the truth is convenient or inconvenient. Paul knew that because there were a lot of times in Paul's life where it wasn't convenient for him to preach the gospel. But he preached the gospel, he preached the truth when it was convenient, when it was inconvenient, when it was welcomed or unwelcomed, when it's well received or rejected, he must preach the word whether he's praised or persecuted. That's what Paul's trying to get Timothy uh, to understand because Paul has lived this out in his Christian life. Uh, He understood the ultimate purpose of preaching. What was it? Well, it wasn't to draw attention to himself. Uh, Paul's told us uh, that uh, it was not about uh, building himself up, but it was was about drawing attention to the Savior, drawing sinners to the Savior. And so he writes now in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, we see Paul's mission. Uh, He says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul the preacher. He was sent to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The foolishness of preaching. What was Paul talking about? Well, we'll look at Paul's life this morning and see what we can learn from Paul the preacher and kind of what this mission statement that he gives us is about. And first, uh, Paul the preacher... Three simple things in Paul's life. Uh, Number one, Paul stood up. Paul stood up. Uh, Time and time again, we see Paul was willing uh, to stand for the Lord and preach the word, to declare the gospel. He was instant, ready, and faithful to preach, convenient or inconvenient, well-received or rejected. He would stand up and preach the word. In Acts chapter 13, verse number 16, What does it begin with? It says, Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. Uh, Rather than to remain silent, what did Paul do? He stood up and boldly preached and proclaimed the truth of the gospel. Why? Because he knew what the word of God said. It had so dramatically transformed and changed his life. He had to go out and share this transformative message with others. Acts 17, verse number 22. Uh, We'll come to this verse later again this morning, but in Acts 17, 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, and he begins to address the group there at Athens. 
In Acts 27, 21, it says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and says, Sirs, you should have hearkened to me. Paul was always willing to stand up and declare the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Uh, Why? Well, because he wasn't afraid. Paul wasn't afraid to stand up and declare the gospel. Uh, It's not always easy to do that. It's not always easy to stand up. Uh, I think back to the Old Testament. I think of uh, the Hebrew children. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar built the golden image and he said everyone's to bow? What did the Hebrew children choose to do? They they, They chose to stand rather than to bow. And what did it end up leading to? Well, their standing led to them burning, didn't it? Their choice was to bow or burn, and they said, we'll, we'll side with God, we'll stand. It wasn't convenient. Paul, he wasn't afraid. Now, did, it, did Paul suffer persecution because of it? Absolutely he did. He was persecuted for his choice to stand for the word of God, to stand for his Savior. But Paul wasn't afraid. Near the end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 11, he's recounting to Timothy some of the persecution he endured. He said, persecutions, afflictions, which came out unto me at Iconium, Antioch, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of, out of them all the Lord delivered me. We talked about some of that last week. We talked about how he recounted how he was flogged five different times, 39 stripes each of those times, uh, the beatings that he suffered. And he says, man, I've been persecuted, but the Lord delivered me. He's trying to encourage Timothy. Uh, Paul's getting ready to pass off the scene, and and he's encouraging Timothy. Hey, there's going to be persecution, but just like God delivered me, uh, what he's done for me, he'll do for you. Don't be afraid. Stand up for the gospel. Stand up and declare the message of Jesus Christ. And he continues to share with Timothy uh, something that as American Christians, I don't know that we really understand this. As soon as he says, I have suffered persecution, uh, but the Lord delivered me. And then he says this in verse 12, and he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Now, as American believers, uh, we may not really grasp that. Maybe the the suffering that we've had, it's not in comparison with that of Paul. Uh, The suffering that we endure, the persecution that we endure, uh, doesn't compare to what a lot of believers uh, living today even endure in other countries. But there are those that are godly, that are living for the Lord, that are suffering persecution today because of it. And I don't... They're probably uh, more brave than a lot of American Christians are in countries where they're told, uh, you don't show up, you don't go to church, uh, you don't speak of the gospel. But there are believers around the world that are just like Paul. They're willing to stand up and talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're unashamed to do so. What would it take for us? I don't know. Mocking and ridicule sometimes is enough to knock us out of the saddle where we don't want to do anything for the Lord. But we know Paul endured much more than that. Early believers endured much more than that. Believers today endure much more than that. American Christianity, we have it pretty easy. There may come a time where we don't have it as easy as we do. And it will really put our faith to the test then, won't it? I've been listening, uh, I think Chad's been listening to it as well. We've been listening to Kurt Skelly's daily devotional podcast, and he's been going through the book of Mark. And just uh, the last few weeks, we've been in Mark chapter 14, 15, and 16, just wrapped up the book of Mark. And in Mark chapter 14, we have all of the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And you remember that the night that Jesus was arrested, the disciples especially Peter, what do they do? They tell Jesus, no matter what happens to you, Jesus, no matter what kind of persecution comes, Jesus, I'm with you, we're with you, we'll follow you, we'll die with you, Jesus. You remember that? You can go read it in in all of the Gospels. And in Mark 14, 29, I'll just read this to you. It says, Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, uh, 
that this day, even this night before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And what began to happen that night when Jesus was arrested? Uh, another verse says they all fled. They all ran away. Uh, there was some persecution coming. And these guys turned and ran. And initially, you know, when they come and arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword. He takes a swipe at Malchus. But then Matthew 26, 56, all the disciples forsook him. Peter, he followed for a while at a close distance, but eventually what did even Peter do? He stands by the fire and says, I don't even know the man. And eventually, what happened to Peter? He heard the rooster crow. And the Bible tells us that Jesus turned and looked. And Jesus' eyes and Peter's eyes locked. I'll die with you, Jesus. But what was Peter doing? He was saying, I don't even know the man. What happens? Fear. Fear can prey on some of the most brave individuals. I mean, we look at Peter and we, I mean, we kind of get on Peter and the disciples for that. But if we were in their situation that same night, we probably would have done the same exact thing. We probably would have turned and, and ran away. I mean, Peter was not a coward. Peter went on to, to stand and to boldly preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter was a tough fisherman. Uh, Peter wasn't a coward, but in that moment, fear gripped his soul. He was afraid. And I find these verses encouraging. A lot of people deal with fear in different situations, and these are good verses to, to memorize. They're good verses to bookmark. Uh, highlight in your Bible, bookmark in your Bible app on your phone. How about Psalm 27.1? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my light. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 34.4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Uh, we talked a while back about praying the Psalms. These are wonderful verses to pray through when you're afraid. Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? Psalm 56, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee, and God, I will praise his word. 2 Timothy 1, 7, Paul wrote these words, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, There'll, there'll be situations in your life where you will have the temptation to be intimidated. There may be an opportunity to talk about the gospel with somebody, but that fear might grip you. Now, we know that fear doesn't come from the Lord, does it? Uh, that, is, that is the enemy working against us, trying to, to silence us, to keep us from sharing the gospel message of Jesus Christ, standing up for the Lord. But remember the life of Paul. He was not afraid. He stood up and preached the gospel. And we have the promise in Hebrews chapter 13. I believe Paul wrote these words. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's God's promise to us. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Sometimes we'll be tempted to hold back from sharing the gospel, but know that you can boldly stand up and confidently say that God is your Savior that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, you can say with confidence those things because uh, God has promised that He'll be with you. He'll help you. Don't be afraid. Uh, there's times when people uh, really don't have time to understand fear. You'll hear somebody, you know, a car accident. Somebody will run into a burning building, something like that. They, what, instinct just kicks in and you, you don't have time to be afraid. You just, you go and you do what has to be done. Uh, on a day like September 11th, 2001, there were a lot of people that ran into buildings in New York City, Washington, D.C. A lot of people that, that acted. A lot of them first responders, but here was a man, he was not a first responder. A man by the name of Benjamin Clark. He wasn't a police officer. He wasn't a firefighter. This man was a chef. 
He was a cook. He was cooking on the 96th floor of the South Tower at Fiduciary Trust Company. And an official later credited Benjamin Clark with saving hundreds of lives. When the planes hit, Benjamin Clark went into action. He began escorting people from the 96th floor down. He made sure the entire floor was cleared. He was the last person to leave the 96th floor on his way down. He gets to the 78th floor and encountered a lady in a wheelchair. And he made sure he got her to safety. And what did he do then? He went back to try to find more people to get out. His mother said he could have gotten out alive. Everybody else on his floor survived except him. He didn't have time to be afraid. He just he kicked in. Uh, he was a former Marine. He didn't want to see anybody left behind. He felt a responsibility. He said, I don't have time to be afraid. There's a job to be done. And he knew it was up to him to do it. See, there's a message we need to get out to people. A time is running out for them to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We really don't have time to be afraid. We need to go share the gospel message. Just like there were people in a burning building that were going to die if he didn't take them to safety. There's people that we know in our lives. They'll face a burning hell if we don't get them the gospel message. Paul was not afraid and he was not ashamed. Uh, there was a lot of pressure against those who believed the gospel. I mean, we remember what was Paul doing when he became a Christian. He was persecuting believers. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure against the gospel. And it was a day when idolatry was prevalent. I mean, they were in a lot of cities where they were worshiping other gods. And so Paul proudly and unashamedly proclaims the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And he writes in Romans 6, uh, 1 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, Paul, this was more than just an intellectual acknowledgement. Uh, he, he really believed this. The gospel, it's been centuries since Paul wrote these words. But the power of God is still saving people through this message, isn't it? It still changes lives. It's something that we shouldn't be ashamed to declare. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against this day. Paul wasn't afraid and he wasn't ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the fact that you're a believer. There'll be people, uh, even in, in our country, we may not face the persecution at this moment like Paul did, but you will have people that will try to shame you, people will try to uh, keep you from sharing the gospel message. Don't be ashamed of the fact that you're a believer. Paul stood up and then Paul spoke up. In Acts chapter 13, we see uh, in verse number 14, we see uh, we see this happening. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And then here's what we just talked about. Then Paul stood up. The Jewish leaders, they say, Anybody here have anything they want to say? Paul was ready. He says, yeah, I got something I want to say. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm, he brought them out. And he goes on through Acts uh, chapter 13 here to, be, to recount some of the uh, history of the Jews. Uh, Paul had a golden opportunity. I mean, some, they say, anybody got anything they want to say? Paul, like, yeah, I got something I want to say. And so he comes to uh, a portion of 1 Samuel, and he begins to talk about David being a man after God's own heart. Uh, and he uses the Old Testament, because that's what, uh, that's what these Jewish people read. This is what they were familiar with. And so he goes to 1 Samuel, he talks about David being a man after God, God's own heart, and he begins to work from, from David's seed. And he, in Acts 13, verse 23, he says, uh, God had, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, 
Jesus. Uh, Paul used the Old Testament prophets to preach Jesus to him. Paul had the, the Holy Spirit guiding him. Uh, he knew that, that he needed to use what had been written centuries before to wake them up to see that everything that was written in the Old Testament was to point them to Jesus. It's, the, it's what he had missed for so long. And it's finally what he had understood. When he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he realized all of the things in the Old Testament was teaching him about Jesus. And Paul knew that rather than disputing other things with them, what was the most important thing that these people at the synagogue needed? Well, they needed Jesus. And so he found the easiest way to get from the Old Testament to Jesus, and that's what he preached to them. There was time to discuss other things and, and debate other things, but the most important thing that these people needed was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what he put his entire message around. He found a way to get from David to Jesus. And it's kind of the same in our groups. It doesn't really matter what the background of the people that we interact with uh, is. If they're lost, the most important thing that they need is Jesus. They can be, they can be religious people. They can be, uh, they can be smarter than us. They can be doctors. They can be lawyers. They can be scientists. But what do they need? They need Jesus. Amen. They need the gift of salvation. And it's the same thing that these people in Antioch needed that day. So how was Paul able to speak up? Well, first of all, he was ready. He was ready. They asked, has anyone got a word of exhortation? Paul was ready. Without hesitation, he stands up. Uh, what does 1 Peter tell us? Uh, it tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, what is he saying? As believers, we ought to be ready Anytime there's an opportunity, if we're given the chance to say something, we ought to be ready to stand up, speak up for the Lord. And it doesn't really, uh, wherever we find Paul, we, we see him representing the Savior. He was ready. And he encouraged Timothy again. He says, how do you get ready? And he says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we uh, need more than just church on Sunday morning. It's why we need more than just Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It's why we need more than just Sunday school and church. That's why we have things like Faith Bible Institute. It helps us to be prepared. That's why it's good to have a devotional life, to read the Word of God for yourself every single day. That's why we listen to things like devotional podcasts. Any way we can get the Word of God into our lives, things that will help us, we'll be ready then when a question arises. Especially in something like Faith Bible, man, that goes into a lot of detail. You want to know how the Bible fits together? You want to know uh, different questions, how to answer somebody? you got to study. It takes some work. It doesn't just happen. As believers, we have to be deliberate, preparing ourselves to be able to communicate the Word of God. And when he had a chance to share the Word of God, when Paul had a chance to share the way of salvation, uh, he took it, didn't he? He was ready, and then he was rational. If we go over to Acts chapter 26, this is where Paul's standing before Agrippa. <clears throat> and pretty much this whole chapter deals with this. This is the ruler of Judea. And in Acts chapter 26, verse number 1, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And that's what Paul was waiting for. He was ready, and here we see Paul as rational. Then Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. And Paul, he kind of lays out uh, a model that's really good when it comes to personal witnessing, he starts with his background as a Pharisee. He begins to talk about uh, what he was and what he had been doing. That's a good way to share our testimony with someone. When we're witnessing one-on-one, -on -one, we can tell people, uh, here's what I was before I met Jesus. This is what my life was like. 
And then he describes his stand against Jesus of Nazareth. He tells King Agrippa about the persecution that he was inflicting on those, uh, those believers. And then he begins to describe what God did in his heart. That's where we want to get to, isn't it? Uh, this is what my life was like. But then I met Jesus, and he made a change. Jesus did something. Jesus transformed me. He talks about his heavenly vision and how uh, Jesus stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus and gave him a brand new mission in life. And then he shared what God uh, desired to do in the heart of the listener. Basically, what we want to tell people when we're witnessing to them is, let me tell you what God has done for me, he can do for you. Paul says that, that he was the chief of the sinners. Those who thought they were too far gone, that they were too bad to come to Jesus, Paul says, no. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. That's why he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus is still in the business of transforming and changing lives. And it's one of the reasons why it's good for us to rehearse our testimony. It's one of the things in Master Club that the kids learn at a young age. If they've been saved, uh, one of the badges that they can earn is the testimony badge where they have to share their testimony with people. Uh, it's good for us to recount what our testimony is and be ready to share it. A lot of times we'll do that at church from time to time. There, there will be uh, opportunities where people, especially at Thanksgiving, I can think at times where people have shared their salvation experience, their testimony. Here's how I came to know Christ. And we ought to rehearse our testimony, know it. Work on that. Be ready to share. Here's how the Lord has worked in my heart. Here's the difference that Jesus made. And then use that to go to the gospel. Paul stood up. Paul spoke up. And then here's the third thing we see Paul as the preacher doing in his ministry. Paul stirred up. Paul stirred up. Um, I think that's one thing that nobody would dispute. Wherever Paul went, he made a difference. Uh, he stirred things up. He stirred people up. Some of us are good at stirring things up, aren't we? Are we, are we stirring up the kind of things, though, that Paul was stirring up? Well, I want you to look at four different uh, facets of the Bible preaching of Paul's ministry. Uh, number one, he encouraged. When Paul stirred up, he encouraged. Uh, because saying the right thing at the right time goes a long ways. Uh, what does the book of Proverbs tell us? Uh, a word fitly spoken, what is it? It's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Speaking a right word at the right time, in at least two instances, Paul's encouragement of others had opened the door for him to preach the gospel. Uh, the first time, it was in Acts chapter uh, 16. He was in prison in Philippi. Uh, how was Paul encouraging there? Well, he was sitting in the middle of the prison with his partner Silas. They're locked up. And at midnight, Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas prayed and sang pra praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And most of us are familiar with this account. Their praise was so powerful, what began to happen? An earthquake starts. The prison doors fly open. Uh, but what Paul and Silas were doing, it was so impressive to the rest of the prisoners, nobody runs off, do they? They all stay put. The jailer ends up coming, and because of what Paul and Silas were doing, it gives Paul an opportunity then to preach the gospel, doesn't it? He preaches to the Philippian jailer, and there's no doubt everybody else in that prison heard exactly what Paul was preaching. How many others might have gotten saved because of what Paul was doing that night? Paul preached the gospel. Another strange opportunity for Paul to stand up and speak for the Lord uh, was in Acts chapter 27. Uh, they were out on a ship. They come into a storm. Shipwreck was imminent. But in Acts chapter 27, I want you to listen to what Paul says to everybody on the boat. They're about to wreck. He says, I exhort you to be of good cheer. He's encouraging. We're about to wreck. We're about to, the ship's about to blow apart. Be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. 
Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Well, that would be pretty encouraging to know uh, that he says that uh, only the ship's going to be damaged, nobody's going to die. But how do we know that's true? Well, look at this. Paul says, for I believe God. You see, when we believe God, it'll encourage us. Even in dire circumstances, Paul says, I believe God. Be of good cheer. And then it gave him the opportunity to tell them why he believed God. Why he had heard from God. And so he began to share with them how God could work in their lives. He preached the gospel again. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to share the promises of God with people. Just like he shared one of the promises with Timothy when he said, you know, Timothy, I've suffered persecution, but the Lord delivered me. It's encouraging. As believers, we need to encourage one another. Look for opportunities. There's people here this morning that are struggling with things in their lives. Look for opportunities today to encourage them. Most people need a good word. And we can be the ones to give it. We should take Paul's example and we should stir people up by encouraging them. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Jonathan Wells. Uh, his dad pastors down in Dallas, Texas. Jonathan just started a brand new YouTube channel called uh, Cheer for Others. Based on a sermon that he just heard his pastor preach a couple of weeks ago where the army of Israel, they were in a battle. And it says that David went down into the trenches... And he shouted for the battle. You know what David was doing? David went down there to cheer for all of the rest of the men that were fighting. He was encouraging them. As believers, we need to cheer for one another, don't we? Uh, I would encourage you to go follow that YouTube channel. It's just called Cheer for Others. As he posts content, something he posted this last week, uh, he was encouraging people, uh, send a message to three people today with a note of kindness. Who knows what those three people will be going through, but send a note to three people. Uh, and it's just, it's something to uh, exhort and to edify us to do good things. That's what we're supposed to do, encourage. Not only did he encourage, but he also edified. And here's where we come back to Mars Hill. Uh, this was an intellectual place. They would gather and they would discuss uh, things of knowledge at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And... The Athenians brought Paul after he'd been preaching the gospel throughout Athens. And once he was here, Paul took the opportunity to preach the gospel. In verse number 22 of Acts 17, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. And he said, that's exactly why I'm here. You don't know about him, but I want to tell you about the unknown God. He says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And he took this opportunity to edify these people or to teach them about Jesus Christ, this unknown God. He says, I want to tell you about the unknown God, Jesus Christ. And he didn't leave them there condemned or without an answer. He, he instructs them. You can read down. We don't have time this morning, but uh, Acts 17, 24 through 31, uh, he goes through and preaches the gospel message to them. And he was very effective in his teaching. And as a, a preacher, a, a pastor, we're to be effective and skillful in our teaching, but it's also good for any servant of the Lord. You want to be effective, be able to to talk to people. That's why we're supposed to study, be ready to give an answer. We want to know what we're talking about when we are talking to someone about things of the Bible. He encouraged, he edified, and he entreated. Uh, when Paul preached the gospel, he didn't just leave things the way that they were. What did he, he do? He always came to a point where he gave people the opportunity to come to a decision for the Lord. And that's what we want to do when we share the gospel. We want to come to a point where people are encouraged to make some sort of decision. Paul would challenge the people to repent. Paul would challenge the people to turn from what they were doing and turn to Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter uh, 17, he tells people specifically, 
that repentance is necessary because there's a day of judgment that's coming, and it would be too late at that point for them to repent. So he would entreat them, encourage, implore with them to make a decision for Christ today. Why? Well, he said in, Acts, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he says, we're ambassadors for Christ. Amen. Thinking of Christ as the king, he's in a faraway country. He's in heaven. But he's left us here as his ambassadors to spread the news. And he wasn't just content to let people uh, go on in their own ways. And so he would plead with them to come to the Lord for salvation. Uh, in Acts chapter 14... He says, Sirs, why do you say these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God. In Acts chapter 16, when he finished preaching the gospel to the Philippian jailer and to all of those there, what happened? In Acts chapter 16, 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There was was an entreaty to come to the Lord for salvation. In Acts chapter 26, when he's talking to Agrippa, he goes on, he preaches the gospel to him. And he comes to the point where he says, King Agrippa, after all of these things that I've said to you, are you ready to accept Christ? And Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. Uh, There was always a plea to make a decision for Christ. He encouraged, he edified, he entreated. And then he enraged. Not all of the facets of his his preaching uh, turned out good, did they? It would be wonderful if every single person that he preached the gospel to uh, was excited and ready to receive Christ. But that's not what we see in the life of Paul, is it? Uh, Even... In Acts chapter 9, where we were the last couple of weeks, when Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, it says straightway he went to the synagogue and preached. They were all amazed. What is Paul doing? Who is this guy? What's happened to him? And in Acts chapter 9, 22, it says he confounded the Jews. And it says after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. He preaches the gospel and he stirs them up. They want to kill Paul for the message that he's been preaching. He has to escape down by the wall. In Acts chapter 13, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. And they raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. In Acts chapter 14, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Um, Was Paul doing anything wrong in his ministry? No. Paul was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. But not everybody was excited about what he had to say. It was common for first century believers to share the truth and be rejected. This was very common. And that's why we need to remember what Jesus preached in his Sermon on the Mount in, Acts chapter, uh, in Matthew chapter 5. He said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus is saying, don't take it personally when somebody rejects the message. There's another place in the book of Acts where it says they were persecuted and they went away rejoicing because of it. They went away rejoicing because they'd been persecuted? Why? Well, because they persecuted Jesus and they persecuted the prophets before him. Uh, So if you're in company with Jesus and the prophets, you're in pretty good company to be persecuted, aren't you? Don't take it personally when you share the gospel with somebody and they reject you. Keep going. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, shake the dust off your feet. Go to the next house. Go to the next person. Find somebody who is a willing listener. Sooner or later, you'll find somebody like the Philippian jailer who will joyfully accept Christ. So as a preacher, Paul was willing to stand. He was willing to speak. He was willing to stir things up. He was bold for the Lord. 
in our lives, do we stand up and speak for Christ? Do people we interact with on a weekly basis, on a daily basis at work, do they know that we're Christians? Or do we kind of keep that part of our lives hidden from people? Are we ashamed to talk about things of the Lord? Or do people know, man, that, that's, a, that's a Christian. Do they know they can come to you when they have a problem in their life? Do you stir people up? Do you encourage them to make a decision for the Lord? When opportunities come, let's look at the life of Paul. Let's be like him. Let's stand up, let's speak up, and let's stir people up to come to a decision for the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity this morning that we've had to study from the life of Paul again. I pray that you would use it to encourage us and to work in our hearts and lives. We pray that you'd meet with us in this morning's service and that you would be honored and glorified by everything that happens in this service today. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.